Welcome to the latest Fathom video interview. I'm Jack Hammer Jack and I'm Deputy Editor of Fathom. Joining me today is Editor Alan Johnson, and we're delighted to welcome John Linden. John is the Executive Director of ALMEP, the Alliance for Middle East Peace, and a leading voice in coexistence and peace in Israel Palestine. John is also a visiting fellow at King's College London's Department of Middle Eastern Studies. Welcome, John. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Alan. Good to be with you. John, you're director of Ormet, as, as I said. Can you explain for our for our viewers what Ormet is and does, and speak a little bit about its activities since since October seventh? Sure. Well, Ormet, the Alliance for Middle East Peace, we're the largest network of Israeli and Palestinian peace building organizations. So that's over one hundred and seventy NGOs that are either working internally inside Israel for a shared society between Jewish and Palestinian Arab citizens of the state, or cross border between Israelis and Palestinians in order to try and generate real, genuine conflict resolution between both peoples. Um, and we do two things. One is to work with those members to create sort of more coherence and uh, strength in depth to make them more than the sum of their parts and raise their capacity. And then in internationally, we work with governments around the world to get far more support for, for peace building initiatives in general. The field since October 7th has... Um, has responded in a variety of ways and it varies depending upon the organization and what they're working on. It's important to reflect that every single member without exception is dealing with some degree of trauma right now for some of them incredibly direct with leaders from the peace building field killed, uh, kidnapped, uh, their families in terrible situations in both Israel and in Palestine. Um, but we have actually seen more activity in relative terms than we saw during the May 2021 war. And this war is a hundred times worse. Uh, with a lot of um, really inspirational responses quite quickly to to the, the immediate aftermath of October 7th, where we have members such as Give Out to Viva, for example, that have turned their entire institution into a shelter for evacuated communities from the Gaza envelope area. Uh, we also have um, some amazing activity taking place in the Negev uh, in support of Bedouin, Palestinian Arab citizens of uh, of Israel. Um, who were disproportionately amongst the victims on October 7th, but as is often the case, have been neglected in, in much of the uh, the response. Uh, so we have members like Itak Maki and uh, Ajik Nisbid, who are doing phenomenal work to build greater solidarity. And then also there is um, a really troubling uh, dynamic at the moment of, of threats and intimidation against Palestinian Arab citizens of Israel and a real censorious moment developing. Um, and we have some amazing activity by members of Jewish Arab cooperation and solidarity and creating shared spaces for Jews and Arabs to, to work together and trying to imagine what happens uh, the day after all of this. Um, there is also tensions and difficulties, as you might imagine. Uh, as is often the case in our space, some of it's around terminology or diagnosing the, 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 the moment that we're in right now. Um, and it's normal and expected that 170 organizations won't all agree on uh, on aspects of that. We are also trying to make sure there's a focus on, on the day after, however, because we believe very, very firmly that this community of Israelis and Palestinians that work together will be one of the most important assets that we all have in trying to get out of this nightmare and build something much more just and equal and peaceful and secure for Israelis and Palestinians. Thanks, John. You... Uh... I've been reading your um, feed on X regularly, as everyone should. Um, I was really struck by one thing you wrote. I mean, we don't like to talk about ourselves personally, but it, it struck me that you wrote, this is the worst thing I've seen in my entire life, ending or destroying the lives of my Palestinian and Israeli friends. I mean, we've known each other a long time. I mean, how's this? how have you coped with this? How has this been for you? How are you doing? Thank you. Um, look, the first thing is I'm incredibly privileged, right? I'm living in relative safety and security in uh, in Europe, although maybe we'll get onto it. There's some problems going on in Europe around this issue too. Um, but I have probably more Israeli and Palestinian friends than anybody having done this for such a long time, and they go in both directions. Um, and it's, you know, also some of the images and the stories, but the images kind of are visceral and they, they stay rooted in your head. And my phone is awful uh, i just have this catalog of videos and stills from both palestinian and israeli friends from october 7th onwards that are you know things that it's difficult to to move on from and forget i think it's interesting and noteworthy that most people don't have those images coming from both populations and i think in a way again it is a privilege understanding how 
how traumatized Israelis and Palestinians both are from what they've seen and what's been done. Um, but also understanding that they don't really recognize or fully see the trauma the other is, is living in right now. Um, and you're seeing that become more true over time. I think in Israel, understandably, the focus is still on October 7th and the victims of it and knowing more about them, their human stories, um, and sort of going deeper into that, which is, again, is totally understandable, but not really covering with the same level of, of, of depth what's happening in Gaza right now. And the inverse is true for Palestinians, where there was some reflection immediately on what happened on October 7th, but it was very soon superseded by uh, by events in Gaza, which now make up the totality, really, of, of, of coverage. So, so you know, how I'm feeling is I'm, I'm immersed in both, which is heartbreaking in many ways. And I guess as a coping mechanism, trying to help many of my friends and colleagues through that trauma in, in practical ways where possible, in addition to solidarity and just showing up for them, uh, um, we're also trying to uh, get some uh, family members of, of colleagues and, and members out of Gaza who are in terrible, terrible situations right now in different locations within the Gaza Strip. And then also, I think as probably most of your uh, readers will be aware, um, Vivian Silver, who's um, a very good friend of mine and uh, really an architect of OMEP and of many of our members, most notably uh, Ajik Nisbet and Women Wage Peace. You know, for weeks we thought she had been taken hostage in Gaza, been working with her, her sons and with her friends, trying to campaign with governments to engineer her and all hostages release. And then we found out last Monday, very late at night, that uh, actually she'd been murdered uh, on October 7th. And it had taken five weeks to identify her, her remains. And that's just been really hard. I mean, again, nowhere near as hard for, for family members, but um, Vivian was a family member for the peace building uh, community and she performed an amazing leadership role with so many people. And it was her her memorial and funeral last week in, in Israel. And if I'm very honest, I I haven't really fully uh, moved on from that yet. It's it's kind of present. Thanks, John. Thank, thanks, John. I mean, we extend our, our condolences to you and and to to all colleagues, friends, and, and family of Vivian. And, and for our readers who haven't yet seen the obituary that the father published uh, for Vivian Silver last week, I, I urge you to to read that as a testament to an extraordinary life. Um, to pick up on, on one aspect of, of your first answer, John, <clears throat> I've done similar work in the past, though not nearly to the extent you have. You're not, we've both sat in those rooms where intergroup dialogue is taking place. We've seen sort of how delicate is the foundation of trust and, and mutual respect and listening that that process relies on. What impact is, is October 7th and the, and the subsequent war going to have on those processes? Great question, Jack. Uh, the honest answer is I still don't fully know. It's uh, it's dynamic and it's in process. Some things are becoming quite clear. Um, I think it's going to transform the peace building field and maybe in ways that are quite healthy and, and useful as well. Um, if you think about it, just stepping back, um, many people feel the peace camp in Israel never really recovered from the second intifada. Almost as many Israelis were killed in one day uh, on October 7th as were killed in the entire five years of the second intifada. So it's highly likely that this will have enormous consequences and kind of cascading ones that we don't even fully understand yet on the psychological and kind of liminal space that peace building takes place in. And then for Palestinians, I mean, I don't even know what the multiple is at the moment, but it's uh, it's certainly more than four times as many uh, Palestinians killed in the last six weeks as were killed in, um, in the entire five years of the second intifada. And we know, again, how traumatic that of, of, uh, event was on Palestinian society and on the willingness to engage, right? So, so we're going we're going to have difficulties. There's no doubt about it in the immediate aftermath and in carving that space open. Now, I, you know, I think it's important that we we hold the principle of Israeli Palestinian cooperation and partnership and solidarity as non negotiable, and that needs to be the foundation and the baseline for for all that we're doing. Uh, but then I think we need to look at a lot of the other tactics uh, that are in service of that broad vision with new eyes uh, and not just try and do more of the same initially uh, after this the, the, this war, because it's the, the moment demands reflection and new ideas and new people. And I'm seeing that by the way, already, people who had been very disenchanted or never even involved in the peace building space are contacting me and wanting to get involved or saying, you know, that they still don't know exactly what needs to happen, but we can never do this again. It's something I'm hearing over and over again from both Israelis and from Palestinians. 
Um, uh, and I think that new sort of engagement and involvement will be will be an asset, for want of a better word. I think also one of the things we struggled with over the last decade and a half in particular, the Netanyahu era, era to be blunt about it, is the dominance of the idea of conflict management um, and that a lot of people felt that that was sustainable and the best uh, of possible uh, scenarios and with the current uh, variables. No one believes that anymore. Right, that that idea is dead. Uh, Midvim had did a poll a few days ago that found that only five percent of Israelis believe in conflict management. Now, that is a huge. And I, I, I hesitate using the word in this moment, but an opportunity uh, for us to be able to fill the vacuum that that previously hegemonic idea is going to leave behind with better ideas that are around conflict resolution and Israeli-Palestinian partnership. Uh, and whilst the, the field has to take the time to reflect. And to re-strategize, we also want to make sure we get the balance right because we will have malleability in the immediate aftermath of all of this. It's going to be a plastic moment. And we want Israelis and Palestinians who work together for peace to play a leading role in shaping it. So we have to ask the right questions, but also move towards action as quickly as we can. And John, in thinking about moving forwards, I'm very interested in something you, you wrote about, which is conversation you had with youth in Gaza in 2014 and you said you you learned a lot from that which might guide us in some of the right directions today um could you just talk a little bit about that conversation and what you heard from those Gaza and youth and, and, and how we should be listening to it yeah so it was um uh very soon after the um uh the devastating 2014 war um but not so soon that people were still in that moment of that kind of outright binary, right? And which you're seeing right now. And just, just as a, and a quick aside, don't judge your Israeli and Palestinian friends, colleagues, contacts too harshly by what they're saying or not saying right now. They're so deep in trauma. There will come a period of reflection afterwards. I'm absolutely certain of it within both societies. But it's unrealistic to assume that a critical mass of them will be in a reflective position in the kind of white heat intensity of this moment. But I did detect on that trip, not just detect, I heard it very clearly from a group of around, I think it was 22 recent graduates of three different universities in the Gaza Strip. And there was, there was very real anger. Uh, and I need you to really understand that in every single direction. At Israel, obviously, um, uh, at the devastation that had happened in the Gaza Strip following what had been the longest war we've seen so far between Israel and Gaza, um, but also at Hamas. Uh, very, very significant anger at the PA, at the international community as well, by the way, because Gazans have been completely let down by everybody for, for a decade and a half. Uh, um, but you can really, you could really hear with those young people a sense of um, betrayal, I think is not too strong a word, by people who are supposed to be their governing authority, right, who weren't prioritizing their safety or well-being in any way. And I have heard that, by the way, <clears throat> in this moment, from from friends and contacts in Gaza and in wider Palestinian society. You're not, you're not seeing it at the very top of the discussion. I think honestly, for some people out of a fear that it might be manipulated or taken out of context, and um, because it doesn't in any way replace the real anger that they also feel uh, at, at, at Israel. Um, but I, I, I think in the immediate aftermath of that war, and it's worthwhile noting, the place that I had the meeting doesn't exist anymore, nor does the road it took place on. It's been completely flattened. Um, it seems clear now that Gaza City has been almost totally destroyed. This is the largest Palestinian city in the history of the Palestinian people. And whatever you think about the operation that's currently uh, underway, it's really worthwhile reflecting on what that will do to a national uh, culture and ethos and uh, the story people tell about themselves. Jews still talk about the destruction twice of Jerusalem as being these kind of epoch defining events. And um, this city is gone. And I think people need to really engage with the trauma, depoliticized of, of that effect on, on, on a people. Um, but also then a reflection on why it happened and why it must never, ever happen again. And that's where, you know, I think there will be an opportunity within Palestinian society generally to talk about a new political uh, moment or agenda or strategy um, that needs to be very firmly fixed on, on their national liberation, on freedom, but also understanding that the kind of violence that we've seen in recent weeks, it can't be part of any strategy for Palestinians or for Israelis that's designed to secure liberation or, or security. Um, uh, and and I, I hope, maybe this is me sounding particularly naive now, I hope there'll be space in both societies for that conversation. Like the Violence as a tool to achieve the respective goals of both Israelis and Palestinians has run out of road. 
we can see the devastation all around us and this can never be a dynamic that we repeat again and again within that space there will be room i think for new ideas and new leaders to emerge thanks john well, we're going to hopefully drill into that a bit more now you've written that the quote we need a palestinian politics that stops providing excuses to those who cynically want to avoid the diplomatic process can you elaborate a bit on that for us yeah um look that we've had We've had a decade and a half of Palestinian national division that was very convenient for a lot of people, right? Because I'm, we know this, Benjamin Netanyahu said it to, to a group of uh, Likud MKs in 2019, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to make a case for the immediate uh, sort of creation of a Palestinian state when Palestinian polity is divided in two. Um, so even if you had a prime minister in Israel that was sincerely pushing towards a two-state solution, and we haven't had one of those in a very long time, and if we had an international community that was sincere in two states rather than using it as a rhetorical device, and we haven't had that for a very long time, you would still come up against this very serious issue that Gaza and the West Bank, Fatah and the PLO more generally, and Hamas are, are divided. And number one, that needs to be um, addressed and solved after this conflict, and I actually think it will be. Uh, I, I think that the the division that we've seen will be replaced by something else, and it's yet to be seen exactly what it is. But my comment kind of went further than that as well. Um, once we have a, a united Palestinian polity, which I really hope is is focused very, very clearly on the goal of self determination and statehood and end to the conflict, then that needs to be uh, looking at kind of a, an exercise of looking at what tools need to be used in service of that. And in particular, I would say engagement with Israeli society. I think there's been a sense in Palestine, and I understand it from a kind of emotional perspective sometimes, to find a way around the need to directly engage with the people and the government of your oppressor in Palestinian eyes. And I, I get it, but I'm, I'm not aware of another conflict anywhere in the world that's been resolved without that taking place, and particularly with the power dynamics that we have in Israel-Palestine. At the end of the day, Israel is the entity that is militarily occupying uh, Palestinian lands and if you're not going to engage with Israel and Israelis then you're taking one of the most important tools that you have off the table and I think that's particularly clicked through on a people-to-people -people aspect I get to see and Jack you saw this too no doubt over and over and over again the transformative effect that Palestinian engagement can have on Israeli individuals whereas uh, uh, a disengagement or non-engagement or boycotting kind of uh, stance it leaves Israeli politics uninterrupted. It allows the conversation to be siloed just amongst Israeli Jews about what needs to happen. And it's it's actually, it, it, it's it's radically effective in, in my experience. And Palestinians have absented themselves from Israeli political discourse now since the second intifada. And I think in retrospect, that's a huge mistake. And there's an ability now to, to correct it. And, and at the same time, there needs to be a reflection within Israel on this not being instrumentalized and it actually being sincerely engaged with uh, that there needs to be a, a reciprocal move within Israeli society to really reckon with Palestinian aims and goals and legitimate aspirations. Um, and, and, and then I think, and again, maybe now I sound naive, if we have a real peace process, and I think we need to have one, it's non-negotiable after all of this, the international community, I'm not saying it's gonna be easy, but we need to construct one and it needs to be new. It then creates, the architecture for that engagement to happen at scale. And I think we've been trying to have an absent a diplomatic horizon for a while, and that's really hard to convince Palestinians why they should do it. I think with a diplomatic horizon, it can happen again at scale. And then to answer your question very directly, it can also produce new leaders, because that's the other thing that is required. We need to see political renewal in both societies, I would argue. Everybody in a position of authority owns a share in us getting to where we got to by October 7th. Now, the actual crime itself is Hamas's fault. I want to be very, very clear about this. But the political context, everybody who's been in power and internationally have a share of responsibility for a reality that has now led to more Israeli and Palestinian deaths than we've ever seen in the history of this conflict. And I think new leaders who are who refuse to ever go back to this place need to emerge, and I'd like to see them emerging from that environment where Israelis and Palestinians engage with other. Thanks, John. You touched on our final question a little bit already. I'll just ask you to maybe dig a little deeper. So you've, we've talked about the kinds of positive steps you think uh, the Palestinian national movement should be taking. If we if we turn our attention to Israel, again, without asking you to solve the conflict and, and so on, let's let's keep it um, realistic. What 
what what should some of the next practical steps be? You mentioned reciprocal moves. Um, what would you be urging Israelis to do in in this moment? Um, well, so let's assume we have a ceasefire. We're on the other side of the uh, the current war, and it's kind of looking at that environment and what what needs to happen in Israel. I mean, there needs to be the political renewal that I mentioned, and we're a nonpartisan organization. Um, you know, so we're not advocating for any any party, but we do need to see an opportunity for Israeli citizens to engage with different ideas around resolution of the conflict. And that will have an electoral dimension as well as a broader civic one. I think the conversation needs to begin. As I said, there is only 5% support for conflict management in, in Israel now. There is also very scary, dangerous and immoral ideas being discussed uh, as sort of conclusive ways. Of, of moving beyond uh, conflict management, they need to be utterly defeated in the battleground of ideas uh, uh, and taken off the table, in my view. Um, and then we're left with lots of different approaches for resolution. And they're going to be gradual. Nobody's expecting uh, a final status agreement within months of um, of this war. But I, I, I do think there needs to be space inside Israeli politics for those things to be discussed very broadly again, because it's been a very long time. And I noticed this when, when I talk to younger Israelis, the level of ignorance, and I don't think that's too strong a word, about some of the core fundamental issues that this conflict is concerns. And it's not their fault. It's because it's been taken off the table. It hasn't been discussed by political leaders, by the media in those terms for a very long time. And we have to fix that and reintroduce those ideas. Um, I also think the idea of Israeli security is going to be the governing principle for politics inside Israel in the aftermath of this. And this is where most of the people who who have the most credibility and respect with regards to Israeli security agree that there needs to be a two state solution, agree that only diplomacy can deliver security. I would like to see those voices come to the fore and to be able to demonstrate that the people with the analysis of diplomacy are decorated security officials. The people who are talking about much more scary ideas that I mentioned are very often people who never even served in the IDF, who don't have the first idea about how you secure Israeli lives and are part of the reason why there was allegedly 26 battalions in the West Bank on October 7th and only two in the south of Israel protecting my friends in the kibbutzim. That shows, um, I think, in very vivid terms what part of this debate also needs to be about. Um, I don't think it's possible for Israel to be able to do what it's doing in the West Bank and maintain security in the south of Israel and maintain security in the northern border. And I think it's possible that we came close to something much, much worse in the immediate hours after October 7th uh, that would have demonstrated that in very, very grisly terms. And I think we need, to, and this, this needs to be a conversation in Israeli society, choices have to be made. You cannot protect these isolated outposts and protect citizens in the rest of Israel. And I think you know, there's going to be very, very decorated security officials making making that case. You know, if people think about people like Yair Golan, right? Who's on the left, um, and who spent October 7th driving around like an action man hero, protecting Israeli citizens in his private car. Um, their analysis, I think, should be listened to very, very clearly. And people who are missing on October 7th, they should probably be a bit quieter. John, I, I, can I ask one more question before we go, which is I'd, I'd love to hear your views on. What would a Western civil society activism look like if it was listening to you, listening to the all map communities on both sides and playing a positive role towards moving the international community and Israelis and Palestinians towards the kind of mutual recognition uh, and engagement that you've been talking about, what would, what would Western activism look like? Thank you, Alan. That's a really, really important question. It would look nothing like what we've seen in the last few weeks, the first thing to say. So number one, it's fine to be pro-Israeli, to be pro-Palestinian, to have sort of uh, allegiance or biases in one direction or another. It's completely normal. I think the othering of entire populations that advocacy communities on both sides of this conversation do is not only really unhelpful, um, it, it actually, it sometimes just veers into outright dehumanization. Uh, and I think any activist community that I'm part of, that needs to be a non-negotiable rule, right? We can disagree on policy and politics, but Israeli-Palestinian life, right, the human the human dimension to this needs to be centered. It's not a, a, on the margins. It's, it should be the core value. And I think we've found in recent weeks that there's communities of people that cannot be inside an advocacy community that, that holds that value. And I think it, once we hold that as being our overriding 
kind of uh, position and value, you'll build much more coherence than we actually have at the moment. Um, and I think the second sort of rule or uh, suggestion I would have is to center the Israelis and Palestinians working for peace. Right, right now, everyone is picking their Israeli and Palestinian spokespeople that essentially validate their prior beliefs. And what they're doing is they're creating a perverse incentive structure that is encouraging those on the ground to get more extreme, to be less reflective. Now, I don't judge those on the ground for it. They're in deep trauma. But if sitting in London or, or New York and being part of that dynamic, it's 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 indefensible. We, we should be leveraging our distance and security toward the platforming and amplification of the Israelis and Palestinians brave enough to be working together when so many headwinds are pushing them to do the exact opposite. I think if we center them and amplify their work, we'll end up somewhere much, much better. Um, and it will also form the core of what peace needs to be, right? Like creating more and more silos and distance between both people, even if you it feels right instinctively, you're simply creating more distance that has to be bridged in any peace process. It's, it's counterproductive diplomatically as well as on, on, on a human side. The last thing I would say is about actual advocacy to our governments. Um, and I think there's, there's two very important rules I think we should try and uh, stick to. The first is um, really to not allow old habits to return. We no more conflict management, no more empty press releases saying two state solution, but no policy backing it up. No more deprioritization inside various different foreign ministries. You know, the I'm getting older every year, but the age of some of the people I meet in diplomatic headquarters is getting younger at the very, very same time. And it says a little bit about uh, whether the, the gray hairs are being prioritized on, on this issue and, 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 or on others. And I think we should really hold governments to account and that it needs to be multilateral. We need to bring in the UK, Europe, the United States, the Arab world into a, a process we've never actually done before, which treats this as a problem that has a lot of stakeholders and will require possible spoilers to be inside the tent rather than outside in order to be conclusive. And the final part is linked to, to the top of the question around activism. We have to scale the work of peace builders. So we spent over $44 per person per year on peace building in Northern Ireland, starting 12 years before the Good Friday Agreement. And we ended up with this lattice work of civil society that could pressure leaders towards the compromises that peace required and built the reciprocal trust between communities. We spend like $1.50 per person per year in Israel-Palestine, only started spending it after Yitzhak Rabin had been assassinated. Show me your budget and I'll tell you what your priorities are. Our priorities in Israel-Palestine have not been peace because that's not what we've been spending money on. And I would like to see governments embark on a broad strategy that really scales this work along the lines of an international fund that we've been advocating. Because even if we get the diplomacy right, and that's going to be a heavy lift, we have traumatized, scared and angry populations. We will have spoilers in every direction in both societies. So there has to be a parallel bottom-up strategy in service of a top-down diplomatic strategy. We need both, and one can't uh, succeed without the other. And activists internationally should be calling loudly on their governments to deliver just that. John, thank you very much. Um, in wrapping up, you've given us a, a huge amount of sobering information about what currently is, but I think also a lot of hope for what might be um but crucially only if those of us involved in this space and, and much wider have the kind of bravery and honesty to to face some very tough reality so thank you very much indeed john thanks, thanks. Josh.